Computer languages, the mysterious lines of code let people communicate with the complex object that is a computer. They solved a problem that was decades old and only getting worse as time progressed. That is complexity. Before languages existed, large arrays of levers were the fastest way to create programs. This was slow and difficult to do correctly. Computer scientists' solution to this issue was to make a higher level way to interact with the computer, which is a computer language. This allowed them to build programs without directly writing the bytes. Instead, software called a compiler would automatically create those bytes based on what they wrote in the computer language. But computers can't process languages like English using sentence structure and nouns or adjectives. Instead, they use special words and symbols to explicitly tell the computer what to do. The first ones look archaic by today's standards, but they greatly increased productivity and made programs much more readable. Everything you interact with daily originates from some source code, from internet browsers to your smart toaster. And here's where I get into what this video is all about. As many programmers dream to someday build their own language, given it is what powers all computers and their programs. Although, it seems like a daunting task. It is among those other unachievable dreams, like making an operating system, or making a AAA quality game. But I will show you how I was able to make my own language, and hopefully, inspire you to create one yourself. I have to decide on a few things before I start. First, should it be compiled or interpreted? Compiled programs are single, standalone, executable files. They don't depend on any other programs to run, but they also need to be compiled first. Compiling takes a code and transforms it into machine code, which doesn't resemble what was written at all and can't be edited without recompiling. This process can make the program much more efficient, but it also makes it unreadable and uneditable without recompiling which takes time and means people can't view what they are running. Interpreted programs run the code directly. This means you need to have the interpreter program installed and have the code you want to run. The interpreter goes through the code line by line, reads the instructions, and then executes them. This process means the program won't be optimized, so it may run slower, but it also allows users to view the code they are running and to tweak it. An example of a popular interpreted language is Python. I decided the type I would go with is interpreted, due to its better ease of use, and also just because it would be likely easier to create. I may create a compiler sometime in the future, but right now that is far too big of a task for me to do. The second thing I needed to decide was the syntax of the language. I'm a big fan of c -sharp syntax. There are curly brackets and closing function contents, loops, or if statements. Variable initialization works by first stating a type, then its name, and then value. Functions are defined by their return type, their name, and input arguments, along with their types. Though I am used to C-sharp syntax, I did change it a bit for my own taste. Something I don't really like is semicolons. Each line is required to have a semicolon at the end, otherwise it won't know where it stops. I removed this, so each line just ends when there are no more characters to read. In C-sharp, this does allow for multiple actions per line, such as this, where each semicolon separates a different instruction but I decided the code cleanliness and ease of use would just be better without them. What I changed about functions is they can return any type, and this is the new way to write them. You first type func, followed by its name, and then in parentheses, the names of any variables. I also changed the input variables so they don't require a type either. If statements are basically unchanged, although they don't have any parentheses surrounding the parameters. While loops are just like if statements, but upon reaching the end, they return to the beginning until false, or you call break to exit the loop. Unfortunately, I did not implement a for loop or for each, but it is possible to make those using a while loop and if statements. Now I just had to decide the name of it. The first thing I went with was slang, which stood for stupid language, because it was going to be a lot dumber than Python or C. But then somebody pointed out that slang was already used, so then I decided on Z sharp, which I looked it up is not used by anybody. It pays respect to C-sharp, which I borrowed some syntax from, and just really like. I also made a few logos, like these two for the language, and this one for Z-sharp scripts. Now, my language was just going to be for console applications, with printing text, but I decided to also add graphics using SDL to make it a bit more interesting. A graphics window isn't showing by default, so you initialize it like this. You call a built-in function called zs.graphics.init. Then you provide three arguments. First, the title. This is what will display on the top of the window, right here. It is normally just the name of your game or application. 
and the next two are the screen's width and height. Those are just what they sound like and change the size of the window to the desired resolution. ZS.graphics.init is just one of a large set of some built-in functions and variables, like these math ones and all of the other graphics functions. Some can be done completely in C-sharp, such as clamp or round, but complex ones that require C++ to work have a special name. It follows this guideline, ZS.thecategory.thefunctionName. All functions that require direct access to C++ libraries or are more complex than just a simple number operation need special functions in the interpreter. When you initialize the graphics, you need to have two other functions in your script, start and update. Start executes once at the very beginning, like main. This is where you can initialize sprites and certain variables. Update runs once every frame after start. You put movement here and draw sprites. Now, I won't get too in-depth with most other types or functions, but I do have things like vector2s, sprites, and functions to get key presses. All of those I used to make a simple game. I decided to make Pong. If you are somehow unfamiliar, it's a two-player game where each player can move a paddle vertically on their own side of the screen. You want to hit the ball into the other player's side and try to get it past them, which will then score you a point. It's basically a very simple version of air hockey that they somehow thought looked more like tennis. It's a very well-known and common practice for coders to make a Pong clone to either explore language, graphics library, or just try to get better. Surprisingly, I've never actually made a Pong clone before, so the Z-sharp version will be my first one. The first thing I tried doing was drawing some simple rectangles. I got the left paddle and the right paddle initialized and drawing. You may already see a problem though, and that's that they aren't centered. More specifically, the sprites that I'm drawing are corner aligned rather than center aligned. This means that when I change the position of the sprite, it's actually changing the position of the top left corner. This makes everything slightly offset. I fixed this though by adding my own sprite class, which contained all of the information like position and scale, then applied the appropriate offsets to correctly center the sprites. And there we go, it works. Since this is just a static image, now I need to add controls. I already created a function for getting key presses, so you can just use get key along with its name to check if any button is currently held down. I used this to make the paddles move up and down, and also limited their positions with the clamp function, so they stay within the screen bounds. Now that the paddles can move up and down, they need a ball to interact with. I created another sprite in the middle of the screen and start moving it left. But then it just keeps going. It appears I have forgotten to add collision. So, after a few hours, I got a simple axis aligned collision system working, which takes two input sprites and returns true if they intersect. The ball now bounces off the two paddles and upper and lower walls. It will also respawn in the middle of the screen if it gets past one of the paddles. Now I want to keep track of the score. Similar to the sprites, I created a custom class for loading in the font and updating the text and its attributes dynamically. Now each side will have its score incremented each time it gets the ball past the opposing side. Throughout the making of this Pong game, I had many performance issues, which I initially just blamed on my bad code and my interpreter not being good enough. Then after many hours of grief, I looked up a little bit. The interpreter was in debug mode. If you've ever developed in C++, then you would know that leaving a program in debug mode can immensely decrease performance. This is what my game looks like in debug mode, averaging under 20 frames per second. And this is what it looked like in release mode, over 300 FPS. Sometimes it isn't bad code, just accidentally leaving it in debug mode. <sighs> After the game was done, I also added a simple AI for those of you with nobody to play with. It just matches the height of the ball and is actually impossible to beat because of that. You may have also noticed that there's a net in the middle of the screen. This is just a dotted line I drew in a sprite. Actually, everything I'm rendering is an image on my computer. I can swap this out with anything else if I want to, so you can actually have a customized game of Pong. For those of you who want to make any programs with C-sharp, I compiled it for Windows and Linux. I've never compiled code for Linux before, even though I use Arch and Ubuntu quite often, so learning how to do that, creating a CMake file, and tracking down all of the dependencies I used was quite a process. The source code and binaries are posted on GitHub, so you can go to the link in the description if you want to use C Sharp, play the Pong game, or use the code for your own project. I would be surprised if any of you want to actually make something in this language, but if you want to challenge yourself and are prepared for the amount of frustration this will certainly bring you, then go for it and be sure to send me anything you make at my Discord down below. If you've stuck around for this long, then thank you very much. I wasn't even able to, I've been putting off writing the script for about three weeks already. 
But seriously, if you enjoyed this video, then feel free to hit the like button and subscribe if you want to see more.